This is literally what I spend, well, now I spend 50% of my time doing, but up until this year, it was 100% of my time, was either researching bees or talking to people about bees or keeping bees or letting bees go. It's a lot of, lot of bee stuff, so it's nice to be able to talk about it. Um, so, what we're going to do today is we're going to talk about pollination, why we need bees, what bees do, dispel a couple of myths around honeybees and pollination and extinctions. I'm uh, going to talk to you a bit about who are the bees you're going to see. One of my sort of key takeaways from this lecture I like to give is if you're outside and you see a bee, you'll have a good strong idea as to who it is. So I'll give you some ID tips for the most common species. And then we're going to talk about what problems are. What are sort of the major threats to them are and how we overcome those threats with both national and local and personal actions. That's a nice one. So first off, pollinators. Why do, why do we care? Why do we care about bees? First thing to say is just give you this wee little definition. You've probably heard the term ecosystem services. Now these are provisional, uh, regulatory, supporting, cultural uh, things that nature does for us. One of the other terms you might have heard recently is nature's contributions to people. I like kind of prefer that term a bit to ecosystem services, but for your purposes, ecosystem services, nature's contributions to people, they're the same thing. It's any number of things like uh, trees taking in carbon dioxide, making oxygen. Um, Trees again, filtering water, cleaning water, regulating rivers, preventing floods, uh, soil, insects, bacteria, recycling old nutrients, turning into fresh compost and fresh new nutrients for soil. And then, you know, my big one, pollination, making food for people by the actions of insects and birds and whatnot. So they are hugely diverse. Quantifying them is a fool's game. Uh, you will see lots of different financial estimates for the value of various ecosystem services. Pollination, the numbers are hilarious and extremely vague and jump anywhere from 500 million pounds for the UK to like $2 trillion globally as the financial value of pollination. Calculating that is complete nonsense. It's basically if we didn't have bees, how much would it cost to do all their work, which again, complete nonsense. But I hope you can appreciate that as humans, we need to find some sort of tangible way of estimating their value. We come up with these nonsense numbers for politicians' sake. See my other lecture this week. Pollination, I just love to give this little heads up because not everyone has a full understanding of what pollination is, how it functions. We'll just say bees, but we'll talk more generally about what, who does pollinators in a bit. Bees fly around, they go to flowers. They are looking in those flowers for nectar because that gives them the energy that they need to fly. They're also going to get pollen from those flowers. Now, interesting fact, bees actually eat that pollen as well. It's a evolutionary parasitism on flowers. They will eat the reproductive organelles of flowers to get protein. Some of that reproductive material will stay on the bee's fur during the process of feed feeding on it. So the plant is trying to produce so much pollen that the bee will gorge itself on the pollen and be like, okay, I couldn't possibly have another bite. I'll leave that there for later. So the bee has pollen on its fur. It will fly off. It'll go to another flower. Some of that pollen will rub off on the flower. And in the process of transferring pollen from one plant to another, that plant is now fertilized and will make a fruit. That fruit will contain seeds. That seed will then go on to make a new plant. Pollination is a key ecosystem service. It's how we get every single flower that has nectar in it across the planet. If you don't have bees, other things can do pollination. For instance, one of these sort of big things that gets spoken about is if we, well, Einstein said if we run out of bees, the human race will only last another 10 years because we'll run out of food. Number one, Einstein never said that. It's completely made up. Twitter uh, anachronism, and two, that's also not true. 
the majority of food plants that we consume as people, approximately 90% of our food is wind pollinated. Anything that's grass-based, so rice, wheat, maize, all of these things are the basis of our carbohydrate. There are starches. They're the majority bulk of our food. And they're all pollinated through passive pollination by wind. Okay? So if we run out of bees, strangely, um, we will still be able to feed ourselves. We'll be able to feed ourselves rice and bread and corn, and it will be fine. Problem being that it will be fine, and that's it. So we, we consume 90% of our food from these like 12 main wind-pollinated food sources. The problem being that that other 10% is all insect or animal pollinated, and it's all the stuff that has flavor. So it's all the fruits, all the spices, all the vegetables, all the good stuff is all insect pollinated and animal pollinated. Uh, have you all had these ludicrous adverts for Huel, the sort of the food substitute? So imagine that for the rest of your life you have to consume that gray sloppy gruel. That is the world without insect pollination. No flavor, nutrients, yes, but nothing that actually has any taste to it. So that is why we care about pollinators. That's why we care about animals that do pollination. We will survive, we will just have a miserable existence without them. The other thing we like to talk about with pollination is that you know, if you don't have an animal pollinating your food plant, it will still make fruit. Self-pollinating uh, fruits and vegetables do exist. Uh, and sometimes in the non-self-pollinating ones, you'll get self-crossing. If you don't have enough bees in your orchard, for example, and this is something that we've shown a lot of times with experimental data, if you bag over your flowers on your apple tree so that insects can't get to that flower, you will still sometimes find fruit setting on that part of the tree. And that's where pollen has just kind of fallen off, bounced back into the plant. The problem being that if you exclude pollinators from your food cr uh, crops, the quality and size of the fruit declines immensely. So these are all photos from experiments that I've run where I've excluded bumblebees and honeybees and solitary bees actually in that order, which is nice. I've got the top photo is courgette, where I've excluded bumblebees. Middle photo is a tomato, where I've excluded honeybees. And the bottom photo is a apple tree, where I've excluded solitary bees. And in each case, you do get tiny, really awful, ugly looking fruits and vegetables that are look quite unpalatable. And that is actually a serious problem with the food agricultural supermarket food system that we live in right now, where, yes, you will get crops. They will look terrible. And because supermarkets and grocers will not buy food if it doesn't meet certain standards of like visually looking nice, you will end up, as a farmer, if you don't have enough pollination, you will end up with a crop that you can't sell which financially for the farmer is quite detrimental for the purposes of providing enough food to feed a nation if that food rots in the farm because no one wants to buy it. That also is a bit of a problem because we're making food that we're not eating. So, without pollination, we'll get some food. It'll be grey and sloppy. We'll get some vegetables. They'll be ugly and most people will probably avoid eating them. But we won't die out. The next one I'd like to talk about is the main bulk of my lecture. It is, who are the pollinators? Who are these bees? I really want you guys to walk away from today with, ah, that's a Bombus terrestris. Phil told me that. So first off, give you a quick outline. Who's doing pollination in the UK? It's insect-based. There are examples worldwide of other animals that do pollination. I'll get to them in a bit. But for today, I want you to know that pollination is bees. It's honeybees, it's bumblebees, it's solitary bees, but it's not just bees. Hoverflies, 
which are far more abundant and far more interesting as animals than bees, do a lot of pollination. As do beetles. Uh, what we have, these are all photos of pollinating insects that are in Lancashire. Most of them are spotted on campus. Uh, top right-hand corner there is a really fun beetle called a maybug or a cockchafer. They come out in April, May, June time. Uh, they're usually crepuscular, so you'll find them at dusk. And anyone who's had camping holidays in the UK will, in that time of year will probably know of these guys because they're very sticky. They're very hairy, and their feet have got lots and lots of tiny hairs on them, and they can basically attach to anything. And they're great because they're massive, and they make a lot of noise, and I love them. Also have a ton of butterflies and moths that do pollination. Moths do fly during the day. Uh, you have a lot of burnet moths, actually, on campus. The, um, it's there. The underpass, right? You know those big, steep banks on the sides of the underpass? From about June till September, maybe a bit early, maybe April till September, that bank is covered in wildflowers. And those wildflowers are just absolutely heaving with these beautiful red burnet moths that fly during the day and do a lot of pollination. Butterflies wise, again, lots of butterflies do pollination. This one here is an orange tip. You can probably guess why it's called the orange tip. What's really lovely about this species is that it's incredibly territorial. It will pick a patch of flowers and it will say, this is my patch. No one's allowed in this patch apart from me and that includes you. So if you ever want to have a bit of fun, find some, a patch with the orange tip butterflies on it and just try and stand there near that patch. You will find yourself being dive bombed by a butterfly who thinks it's really tough and trying to defend its area. It's wonderful. Lastly, all of these guys will pollinate wildflowers. They will pollinate fruits, vegetables. That's basically what all of our pollination has been done by. In terms of the specifics, honeybees, most abundant. They are, in the UK, a single species, Apis mellifera. In the UK, specifically in the Northwest, we have what's known as Apis mellifera mellifera, which is the northern black bee. This is a purebred, almost like a pedigree bee lineage with extremely dark, thick bands on its abdomen. This one is supposedly more resilient to cold weather than other subspecies of honeybee. It's not as productive, it um, is less aggressive, apparently. A lot of claims made by beekeepers who breed bees specifically to sell to beekeepers. They are social insects. They are what we call eusocial insects. That is that they have a queen bee that maintains and controls the behavior of her daughters. They are eusocial, so they are looking after themselves. The daughters look after the, each other, they look after the queen, and they look after her offspring. They have a very interesting genetic system that's the basis of the evolution of that behavior that I'll get into if you do evolution next year. They are um, not endangered, frankly. You ever hear someone telling you that honeybees are in trouble, they are lying to you. They are the only insect with a complete global distribution and are, made, uh, are maintained by human beings. The beekeepers are great. They spend all of their time looking after honeybees, and they are in no risk of ever going extinct. They're also great because they make honey. You can provision a lot of money out of selling the honey that they collect. You can also sell their wax. You can sell their uh, propolis, which is a material that comes from tree saps that bees collect. Bees use that as a cement in their hives. It's really quite interesting material. They are in trouble. They're also not the best pollinators. They're very numerous. So you can get 30,000 bees in a single hive, and that 30,000 bees can pollinate 30,000 flowers, but they'll take their bloody time about doing it. 
So per individual bee, honeybees are actually one of the most inefficient pollinators on the planet. It's just that there are so many of them that that inefficiency is kind of compensated. Bumblebees, on the other hand, are extremely efficient pollinators. So when I talk about bees going from one flower to another to, and looking for food and pollinating and transferring pollens that way, honeybees will go to a flower, come back to the hive, go out again, come back to a hive. That's what makes them inefficient, is there's a lot of travel involved. Bumblebees will go out, they'll go to a flower, they'll go to the next flower, and to the next flower, and to the next flower, and then they'll head back to the hive. And because there's so much more movement in between flowers happening, bumblebees are super efficient when it comes to pollinating. Now, here's the promise. In the UK, we've got 25 species of bumblebee. Three years ago, we had 24. We've uh, re we had an extinction happen uh, of the short-haired bee, the yellow short-haired bee. That one went extinct and has recently been reintroduced from uh, individuals brought over by the charity Bug Life and the Royal Society for Protection of Birds, uh, reintroduced to Dungeness uh, Bird Reserve down the south coast, which is great. We have a reintroduction of a species that was formerly extinct. Hooray. So now we're back up to 25. Of those 25, you are, if you're very lucky, you're going to see about two of them. Likelihood is in your lifetimes you may get to spot these eight. So these are the eight most incredibly common species of bumblebee in the UK. And I'm going to run through some very quick, easy ID for you. So if you're out, you can show off to your friends. Ah, that's Leucorum. That's Terrestris. Okay? These eight species, lovely little cue card. Number one, Bombus terrestris, the most common species. This is also the species that is artificially bred for the purposes of pollinating in greenhouses. You can actually buy boxes of Bombus terrestris on the internet. Um, they freak out the postman because of all courier companies in the UK, the Royal Mail, are the only ones that take live animals. So you'll get your postman coming along with a box that's vibrating angrily at him, which is great fun. Happens to me a lot. Bombus terrestris has what we call is the buff-tailed bumblebee, which means it has a tail which is a slightly off-yellow, whitish color. It looks like a dirty brown t uh, tail on it. Um, oftentimes, uh, I was always confused as what the term buff-tailed meant, what the color buff is. Um, yeasty is a good summary of it. It's kind of this sort of peachy, yellowy, brown color. Nicely contrasting with number two, Bombus leucorum, which has a bright white tail. This one is called the, obviously called the white tailed bumblebee. It's also called the garden bumblebee. Sometimes it can be hard to tell them apart unless they're next to each other. But if you see them with those nice black, yellow, black, yellow, white stripes, very bright white, that's going to be leucorum, nine times out of ten. Red-tailed bumblebees. Now these guys, oftentimes, you'll see in this photo, I've got a yellow band just behind the head and a red at the back. Often, you will never see that bee having that yellow band. Okay? Leucorum, oh, sorry, bleh, Lapidarius, the red-tailed bumblebee, loses its hairs very quickly in life, apart from the red ones on its tail. And that is often the problem with identifying bumblebees, is that they shed constantly. So all these lovely stripes you see in pictures in books, and you find a bee in the field and it's just a pile of black with a couple of ginger hairs on its bum. That makes it very hard to ID them. But if you see any red on a tail, the likelihood is you've got a, a, a red-tailed bumblebee, unless you ever see any yellow hairs on it at all with the red, in which case you've got number four the early bumblebee. Uh, Bombus praetorum, early bumblebee, gets its name because it appears at the very start of the year. It's probably one of the earliest bees you will see in the year. I've got a number of my friends on Twitter, because all my Twitter friends are bee people, boasting about how they have spotted their first praetorum queens of the year because they all live in the south and they get them out a lot earlier than I do, and I'm very jealous right now. But I expect in the next couple of weeks I might get to see my praetorum queens re-emerging. Next up, Hortorum, the garden bumblebee. Different to the white-tailed bumblebee, these two are often very easily confused. 
Um, and that is because they're basically the same, and it's frustrating. Leucorum is much more common than Hortorum. Okay? The white-tailed bumblebee, which is often accused with the garden bumblebee, has um, yellow face fuzz, frankly. You will see yellow hair on, on its face, although, again, often those brush off. Uh, the Hortorum garden bumblebee has a much bigger face, big eyes, long mandibles. You can see a bee and you make out it's got this big, chunky face. It's almost certainly going to be the garden bumblebee with the white tail. But that requires you to get quite close to them. Bumblebees are great. They're very tolerant. But obviously, they can sting you if they get properly motivated. And if you are here, that's enough motivation. <laughs> um, the last three, still relatively common. Pascorum, cardaby, is really easy to distinguish, mostly because their song is completely different to the rest of these bumblebees. Bumblebees, fairly low-pitched noise when you see them flying around. Cardabies, there are a few of them in this country. They are bumblebees, but they just have a much higher-pitched song. So if you ever hear a loud, high-pitched buzzing noise, you found cardabies. But we're also mostly ginger hair all over. They are smaller than most bumblebees, um, and they tend to fly in a sort of a round, spherical shape as opposed to most bumblebees, which will fly kind of flat out like a blob. Next up, tree bumblebee, heath bumblebee. But Hypnorum and Janellus, super easy. You will only ever see the tree bumblebee in a tree. It's a nice, easy to define thing. Um, you can, uh, these guys nest in trees, they feed off trees, they basically spend all their time up here. Heath bumblebee, you'll never guess where you find the heath bumblebee. I find them in Heathland. You find them where Heather is. Um, Cluffer, Nicky Nook, Onside Knot, all places where, if you are lucky, you will find Bombus genellus. That being said, of these eight common species, they are the most rare and difficult spot. Those are your eight bumblebees. They're the ones you're going to see. They are all very lovely, very pretty creatures, and with some basics looking out for certain things like tail color and face shape and body shape, you will know very quickly what they are. There are obviously 25 other species. Nine through 19, extremely hard to find. My favorite, number 14 there, Bombus monticular, whenever people ask me what my favorite bee species is, it's an easy one for me. It's Bombus monticular, it's the bilberry bumblebee. This guy, extremely rare can only really be found in two sites in Lancashire um, and a few sites outside of there in the UK. They're lovely. They have this really unique combination of a very long orange tail and a yellow stripe. But yeah, really hard to find. Um, these 1 through 19 are all common bumblebees. Okay? They are nest forming. They have sometimes one, two, three queens inside a little nest, the subterranean, or in a tree hollow. Basically, anywhere you can hollow out and find a little safe, safe spot, bumblebees can nest. They make uh, daughters, just like honeybees. They send the daughters out as foragers to find food. They come back. They do pollination. There are six secret bee species in the bumblebees. They're called cuckoos, and they act just like the bird. They parasitize other bumblebee species' nests. So the queens of the cuckoo species will fly in. They'll burrow into the hives of nests of other bumblebees, and they'll lay their eggs inside that nest. And the eggs will hatch, and the other bumblebees will be like, oh, great, more babies, let's just keep feeding them. And they are cuckoo them. They do pollinate as well a little bit. And there's this really lovely sort of parasitism, mutualism system going on there, where you have cuckoos parasitizing different species, bumblebees. Identifying them is a pain. The closest ID help I've ever been given with them is that if you have a cuckoo bee and a non-cuckoo bee next to each other, their fur and their body shape will be identical, but their cuckoos will have slightly smoky-looking wings. 
which is such a painful identification tip because you need to get both of them next to each other and compare their wing cover. Don't worry about identifying them. Not worth the pain. Now, that's honeybees. That's bumblebees. Last up, solitary bees. Had 25 bumblebee species. We've got over 250, 283 last time I checked. Solitary bee species. These guys do not form nests. They are not social, as you can tell from the name. They're often misidentified. They're often seen as either flies or wasps or, a lot of times, honeybees. Uh, they are what we call self-employed bees. There's no nest, but they do have to lay eggs. The bees themselves will go out, they'll provision food for their own offspring and no one else's. They can nest in, lo in lots of the same, lots together in the same area. So we call uh, accumulations or agglomerations of solitary bees. Uh, that isn't them nesting cooperatively. It's just that solitary bees have had a very hard time of it over the last 30 years, and there isn't actually that much environment left for them to nest in. So when they find somewhere to nest, they pile onto that area. They can nest in the ground. They can nest in trees. Very often you'll find them burrowing into sandy uh, flat edges, like on riverbanks, things like that. They're extremely hard to manage because they're very sensitive creatures. Because they are very limited in the space they can nest in, uh, they are um, very easily have their nests destroyed. They're also much more sensitive to pesticides. They've had a very hard time of it. Their numbers are extremely dwindling in the UK, and looking after them really should be people's priorities, which is why every time someone talks about honeybees going extinct, I get a little bit angry because the solitary bees need the help a lot more than honeybees do. They're also the most efficient at pollinating because unlike bumblebees that have to go back to the nest with their visit, 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 back, honeybees go out and back, out and back. These guys are constantly moving between flowers because they don't have a nest to go back to. <coughs> Conserving solitary bees, massive pain. There are some things you can do which I'll cover at the end of the lecture. That being said, they are very lovely and you can afford to spend some time watching them. Oh, black flash, there we go. Um, last thing to talk about is all the stuff that what isn't a bee pollinating in the UK. 1,500, 2,000 species of flies, small black flies, big black flies, blue bottles, green bottles, all do pollination. They're all lovely creatures, so you look after them. Um, Busflies, beetles all do lots of pollination. This creature in the top right hand corner is called a bee fly and they are great. They are a parasitic fly species on bumblebees. So they will sneak into bumblebee nests just like cuckoos do and lay their eggs. Except they're a bit more aggressive and they will eat most of the other larval bumblebees inside that nest. That being said, they're kind of adorable looking when they're adults. And then the last one, what about wasps? So wasps are fantastic creatures. They are predators. They eat pest species. They eat caterpillars. They eat aphids. They also pollinate. And I believe, but I'm going to mute just in case I deafen you all. This here is video evidence of a wasp pollinating courgettes slash squash, whatever they are. They are really good at it. <laughs> They're amazing and if you get upset, annoyed by wasps, kind of maybe don't because they do a lot of pollination and they're incredible creatures and you should look after them. And this, I think, is one of the cutest videos I've ever shot of a bee, of an insect. Look at it, it's covered in pollen. It's just like, ah, oh, it's just all in my face. I need to get it off now. And it's just really annoying. Get it off. They look how much pollen's on that guy. Look at the pollination it can do. It's amazing and really cute. Lastly, not for the UK, worldwide, we have a lot of species of birds and bats that do pollination. And these guys, again, the big, cool, expensive tropical fruits, mangoes, bananas, coffee, durian and guava, all bat or hummingbird pollinated. When we're talking about pollinator conservation, 
anywhere in the tropics, we have to think about these species. You don't get bumblebees in the tropics, but you do get hu hummingbirds, and they are just as sensitive to environmental disturbance and very important as pollinators. Now, let's give you a quick rundown of what's happening. I've been talking about all these sensitive species and things happening to them. Pollinators, globally, particularly in the UK, there's no one thing that's doing them in. We've got multiple threats all coercing together on pollinators to cause an overall decline globally. We've got new pests and diseases invading. We've got land use, to, uh, habitat destruction due to intensified agriculture. We've got pesticides as a direct poisoning effect and indirect effects as well. And lastly, we've got climate change. I'm going to run down what each of these factors do individually. When you are talking about pollinators decline, it's vital that you highlight that it's not just pesticides or poisoning bees and killing them. It's pesticides interacting with climate change, with habitat loss, with intensified agriculture, with new pests, new diseases. Every factor acts on itself and acts on the bees. So when we talk about land use change, habitat loss, what we're talking about is mass tree felling, destroying nest sites. We've got destruction of hedgerows, which destroy nest sites and food sites. We've got urbanization, so there's just less green space available for bees to feed on. We've got habitat fragmentation. So this is the same thing you see with um, vertebrate conservation. Lost the word of it then. Um, where you have patches where animals, particularly bees, used to live and used to fly between those patches. And as those patches shrink due to all this land use change, bees can no longer travel between those distances anymore because they're getting further and further apart as the edges get worn away. So you end up with patches becoming more isolated, less genetically diverse, more susceptible to new pests and diseases because they cannot interbreed with each other anymore. Same effect you see with the elephants, you can see it with bees. Next up, agrochemicals, pesticides to everyone else. Obviously, insecticides, kind of bad for insects. Insecticides are designed to kill insects. Some agricultural chemical producers will tell you, no, our one's really good because it only kills this one specific insect. And inevitably, we find that is not the case. See the case of neonicotinoids, supposedly both a chemically very targeted insecticide just for like cabbage flea beetle. It just kills that one cabbage flea beetle. Yes, it just kills it, but what we see are these sublethal effects in other organisms like bees. Neonicotinoids are a great example because you've got this thing that kills this beetle and then also affects the learning and memory in honeybees, which... That's kind of an important factor if you're a pollinator, is being able to memorize where food is. What we see is, there's a lot, these are figures are still relevant, they're still proportional. 2016 was the last national assessment of pesticide use broken down by individual pesticides. 315,000 kilograms of insecticide is a lot. That being said, it kind of pales in comparison to herbicides. Seven million kilos of, pesticides, of herbicide deployed every year. Now this stuff, it doesn't kill bees. It's a herbicide, it kills plants. What can you see is the problem there? We're spraying herbicide on weeds. We'll point to dandelions. Dandelions are great. If you spend set eight million kilos of herbicide killing off every single dandelion in on the country, that means there isn't going to be dandelions available for bees. And bees love dandelions. They're great. They're an amazing source of high quality pollen and nectar. So if you're killing off all the alternative non-crop food plants for bees, what's left for them to feed on? It's basically nothing. Now that for a long time was thought, you know, that's a really nice semi-indirect link that can be a good cause of what's happening to bees, herbicides knocking out their food plants. New research that we're finding, which is really cool, 
is that these herbicides, in particular glyphosate, which you know, has a lot of problems with human health, it also impacts the bee bacteria in their guts. So all insects and all animals have gut bacteria, helps them digest food. Bee gut bacteria, super important, helps them digest that pollen that they're ingesting. Herbicides, particularly glyphosate, are shown to kill off the gut bacteria of honeybees, meaning that they're not able to digest pollen. That's a really interesting effect where you're actually giving them herbicides, it's knocking out their food, and what food they've got left that they can eat, they're struggling to digest because their gut bacteria is being disrupted. Now, hopefully you can begin to appreciate that is another one of those multiple layers of effects happening. Multiple, you have like one thing impacting another thing and then causing downstream effects and all these combinatorial multi-level effects that are causing pollinators to decline. Next thing we want to talk about very briefly is building on that we're wiping out all the weeds which bees like to feed on. We're also increasingly reliant on monocultural farming. That is, well, in America is a great example, millions of hectares devoted to just one crop, in this case, almond orchards. Which is fine-ish, at least when the bees are there, there is a lot of food for them to eat for like two weeks, whilst every single plant is in flower. Problem being that, one, second those flowers die off, there's no food left for the bees at all, because you've destroyed all the rest of the flowers using herbicides. And two, what if that crop doesn't flower that year? Particularly in the case of trees, which are fixed in place, you can't really change the crop mid-year. When you have a, a statewide drought, as we are increasingly seeing in California, you end up with a bunch of trees which aren't flowering because of the drought, which means the bees, waiting for that one time of year when there's a lot of food, have nothing. So this is a case, an early case, where we see things like climate change, at the very least droughts, impacting pollinators. In relation to agricultural practices like monoculture. Next thing I want to briefly touch on, these are mostly honeybee troubles, um, are new pests and diseases. Problem with honeybees is that people like to move them a lot. Beekeepers will get in their expensive cars and drive to Romania to take a queen bee that they've heard of as really cool from Romania and drive it back to Lancashire. This actually happens regularly. There's very little in the way of border control for honeybees because very often people will just get their queen, which is about this big, put it in a matchbox, slip it in their coat and walk through customs. It's like bee smuggling. It actually happens. It's ridiculous. The problem with this is that without any sort of control, the borders you end up with transport of a lot of new pests and diseases from around the world. Asian hornet is obviously the big lookout for this right now. I have a nice little picture of it here. Um, that's a major invasive threat, not just to honeybees, but to a lot of our insects. We also have roa mite, which is one bottom photo there. Black mites on the sides of bees, found out recently not to be feeding on their blood, but on their fat. So uh, uh, there was actually an interesting comparison. We say that they're like um, vampire bees because they feed on the bee blood. It's not true. They're actually werewolf bees because they feed on the bee flesh. They also transmit a whole bunch of diseases. Uh, bacterial, fungal, viral diseases all transmitted by these mites. And if it's not just that, which is fantastic to find, when a honeybee goes to a flower takes some nectar from it, has a couple of mites on it. Those mites drop off because, ah, if I stay on this flower, I can move to another nest and exploit that as a new resource. Yay. Problem comes, of course, that we're finding that if a bumblebee then goes to that flower, the varroa mite will jump to a new species. Varroa mite is supposedly just a honeybee pathogen. It can also jump to bumblebees, which is terrifying as a sort of way of introducing new pathogens to already very sensitive species like bumble and solitary bees. And then lastly, let's briefly touch on climate change. So, I don't think you've had the Ian Hartley's blue tip talk yet. It might not be till next year. But, animals are very good at synchronizing with their environment. 
Honeybees, bumblebees, and solitary bees are no different. They hibernate over winter. They sleep when it's cold. And then they re-emerge in the spring when flowers are back. It's a nice fixed system. They go to sleep when there's no food, they wake up when there is food. Climate change is disrupting that system because it's causing earlier, shorter winters. So spikes of heat like we're having two weeks ago, which caused all the bees to wake up. Caused all the flowers to start growing again, which is wonderful. They're still quite synced. What we're seeing though is not that everything just moves sooner, it's that everything moves sooner and then we resume the cold winter again. This weekend we are resuming the cold winter. All the effort bees go into, into coming back from their winter hibernation, all the effort plants go into coming back from their winter hibernation gets disrupted because you have hot, then suddenly cold, which is actually seasonal because it's meant to be cold right now, and then back to hot again. During that second cold period, all, they basically go back to, to feeding on their food stores, which they don't have, but they've got loads more mouths to feed because it's like, okay, cool, let's start making more work because let's get everything going again. The disruptive effects of climate change on synchronized environmental systems like bees and flowers, like blue tits and winter moth, is causing serious issues for the survivability of pollinators. And something we are getting a lot more information on every year. What can we do? There are some stuff that, there's some things that are happening. We are working quite hard to save, save the bees, as it were. Uh, Agro-environment schemes, now that we have supposedly a new funding scheme for farmers to plant things that are nice for the environment, we expect this to continue. But as it stands, the EU have a fantastic system for funding farmers to put wildflower strips around their crops. It had a massive uptake, uptake in the UK up until about 2012. Can't think why that dipped off. But we have areas set aside for wildflowers that get around that whole blasting the area with herbicides, blasting it with pesticides. And there's land set aside for bees, flies, butterflies to all get food on the edges of crops. They then migrate into the crop, pollinate that crop, so the farmer sees the benefit of providing food for bees. In terms of broader conservation, ecological focus areas, as they are now known, um, are great, basically set aside areas of wild land. They can be enormous, they can be tiny. They provide nesting areas, they provide food, they provide structure to the environment. They're basically trying to provide this continuous supply of food and nesting sites for pollinators, and they are reasonably effective. As I pointed to earlier, monocultures are very, very common, but they're also extremely inefficient. Yes, you can grow a lot of the same food and harvesting is really easy, but the amount of food you can get from a monoculture is actually proportionally smaller than you get from a diversified, sequentially planted cropping system. When you're giving lots of strips of land to different crops, you see an increased pollination efficiency, which means you see an increased crop yield and crop quality. Communicating that to farmers, usually really easy. You just tell them, just rather than planting 10 hectares of oilseed rape, plant five and then have another five set off for like turnips or something, <laughs> whatever works on your land. You can demonstrate with that that you end up with more pollinators, better quality crop. Now, wildflower strips are super easy to do. Farmers are experts in planting seeds in the ground and getting things to grow from them. Wildflower strip creation is just that. Rather than putting down seeds like carrots, you give them 50 different wildflowers and they plant them in a strip along the outside. They grow really nicely. They're not necessarily the best thing though. <laughs> they're really easy to do, which means they're really easy to get people to, to start to take, but they're not the most efficient source of food and habitat. A research that I've done with undergraduate project students here, hooray, uh, demonstrates that 
proportionally, even though there is a much smaller amount of land given over to woodland, hedgerows, woody structures, relative to the amount of land given over to wildflower strips, most bees prefer to go to the trees, the hedgerows, for their food than wildflower strips. This may be a taste preference. Our argument was that it's actually a 3D structural difference. When you have a tree, nice big orb, you have a three-dimensional surface in which flowers can be. When you have wildflower strips, it's planted along the ground, it's completely flat. There's not actually as much room for the bees to go to. So by planting trees, nice big three-dimensional structures, you end up with a lot more flowers in a smaller area. Obviously, planting hedgerows, planting trees, wooded areas, a lot more time and effort goes into that. It's actually a lot harder. But the results are substantially more uh, useful for bees. And then, lastly, what can you guys do? Some simple tips and tricks for next year when you have your own places outside of campus and some stuff you can do whilst you're on campus. Any green space you've got, please plant some flowers in it. Um, don't care if it's, a tr if it's a hedge or if it's bulbs or if it's seeds, just plant some stuff. But I love this photo, uh, this little graph. It's really lovely and old and tr it still holds true. Plant sequentially. Plant a whole bunch of different stuff that you know flowers one after the other. So you have a continuous supply of flowers. Having iris, um, crocuses, then daffodils, then tulips, then alliums, then lilies, they will result in you basically having a constant supply of flowers in your garden, which looks nice and also is really good for the bees because they spend their time learning where flowers are. And if you can convince them that they don't need to do any more time learning new areas because there's always going to be food here, that's really nice. Also, please plant native things. I'm really sick and tired of seeing like American flowers and Himalayan balsam and just stuff that's not supposed to be here planting in people's gardens. Try to go native if you can. Wildflower mixes are great. This is a really beautiful example. One thing I love to point to is, you know how I was saying about wildflower strips, kind of two-dimensional? You can break that. You can plant lots of different kinds of flowers that grow to different heights. So here we've got uh, campanula, we've got borage, we've got poppies, uh, and you can even, if you want to, you can have some sunflowers. Plants that grow to different heights, one thing that they offer lots of different opportunities to bees, and you can actually have flowers stacked on top of one another, so you end up with this really dense provision of food for bees. Think about what you're planting. Think about how it, well, obviously this looks beautiful. And it's really nice to have that much diversity. There's a function to that diversity. There's a function to that beauty. Next thing, number one, stop using any pesticides. So you have no reason to use pesticides anywhere. Step two, tell your parents to stop using pesticides back home. Step three, tell them, get them to tell their neighbors to stop using pesticides. There's no legitimate use for shop-bought pesticides in people's homes and gardens anywhere. Mostly because this stuff will kill you. But also, there's no point to it. It, it has no benefit. Just leave it alone. It's a huge waste of money and cannot abide by it. Habitat generation. This, if you've got more space, love doing. Even if you have tiny space, sticking some broken bamboo canes in a coffee cup will provide nesting habitat for solitary bees. Just make sure you clean it out every couple of years and re refresh it. Bug hotels are also great as well. There's a really lovely one, RFPB Leighton Moss, which is always humming uh, in a couple mm, April time with things that are nesting in it. And lastly, I get asked this at the end of lectures most years. Well, not since I've introduced this slide, obviously, but rescuing bees. So. If you see a bee and you think oh, it looks like it's in trouble, honestly, most of the time, leave it. It's either resting, it's sleeping, or it's a diseased bee that's been expelled by the nest, and it should probably be not being given sugar to go back to the nest and spread that disease further. That being said, if you are a massively soppy person for bees, like I am, and you really want to do something to help them, 
boiled water, one ton of sugar, cool it down, give it to a bee, and just in a little sterile cup and leave it. Don't try and force the bee into the sugar, just leave it next to the bee. Bees are very good at smelling things. They will find that sugar if that's what they want. And very importantly, take it away, leave it out for like an hour and then just get rid of it. Don't leave it there permanently. Sugar water is great for bacteria. So if you leave sugar water outside, it will get colonized by bacteria, that bacteria will be pathogenic and it will make the bee sick. So, tiny bit of sugar, put it out, and take it away again after an hour. Even if the bee hasn't touched it, you're much safer. Uh, and then the last thing is, if you want to conserve pollinators, don't keep honeybees. Honeybees are terrible for pollinators. They hoover up all the food, they spread pests and diseases, and they are not native to the UK. Honeybees are native to, at best, Southern Europe. They're actually native to Northern Africa. The only reason they're in the UK is because we put them here. Native pollinators like bumblebees don't do well when there are honeybees in the environment. So stop keeping honeybees. I keep honeybees for experiments, for science. And that's the only reason I can even just make think of why you want to keep honeybees. Um, Stuff you guys think about. Take away, think about more. What can you do more to help promote pollinator diversity? If that's talking to people, if that's convincing people about pesticides in their gardens, do it. Plant stuff. Think about things other than honeybees doing pollination and go and spot something out there that isn't a honeybee doing pollination. Thank you, everyone. I'll see next tutorial group in about 10 minutes. <laughs>